Time and Time Again by H. Beam Piper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. Time and Time Again by H. Beam Piper for the X-1 Collection. To upset the stable, mighty stream of time would probably take an enormous concentration of energy, and it's not to be expected that a man would get a second chance at life, but an atomic might accomplish both. Blinded by the bomb flash and numbed by the narcotic injection, he could not estimate the extent of his injuries, but he knew that he was dying. Around him, in the darkness, voices sounded as through a thick wall. They might have left most of these Joes where they was. Half of them won't even last till the truck comes. No matter. So long as they're alive, they must be treated. Another voice, crisp and cultivated, rebuked. Better start taking names while we're waiting. Yes, sir. Fingers fumbled at his identity badge. Hartley, Allen, Captain, G5, Chem Research, AN, Slash, 73-D, Serial, SO, 23869403J. Alan Hartley, the medic officer, spoke in shocked surprise. Why, he's the man who wrote Children of the Mist, Rose of Death, and Conqueror's Road. He tried to speak, and must have stirred. The corpsman's voice sharpened. Major, I think he's part conscious. Maybe I'd better give him another shot. Yes, yes, by all means, Sergeant. Something jabbed Alan Hartley in the back of the neck. Soft billows of oblivion closed in upon him, and all that remained to him was a tiny spark of awareness, glowing alone and lost in a great darkness. The spark grew brighter. He was more than a something that merely knew that it existed. He was a man, and he had a name and a military rank, and memories, memories of the searing blue-green flash, and of what he had been doing outside the shelter the moment before, and memories of the month-long siege, and of the retreat from the north, and memories of the days before the war, back to the time when he had been little Alan Hartley, a schoolboy, the son of a successful lawyer, in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. His mother he could not remember. There was only a vague impression of the house full of people who had tried to comfort him for something he could not understand. But he remembered the old German woman who kept house for his father afterward, and he remembered his bedroom with its chintz-covered chairs and the warm-colored patch quilt on the old cherry bed, and the fan curtains at the windows edged with dusky red, and the morning sun shining through them. He could almost see them now. He blinked. He could see them. For a long time he lay staring at them unbelievingly, and then he deliberately closed his eyes and counted ten seconds, and as he counted terror gripped him. He was afraid to open them again, lest he find himself blind or gazing at the filth and wreckage of a blasted city. But when he reached ten he forced himself to look, and gave a sigh of relief. The sunlit curtains and the sun-gilded mist outside were still there. He reached out to check one sense against another, feeling the rough monk's cloth and the edging of maroon silk thread. They were tangible as well as visible. Then he saw that the back of his hand was unscarred. There should have been a scar, souvenir of a rough-and-tumble brawl of his cub reporter days. He examined both hands closely. An instant later, he had sat up in bed and thrown off the covers, partially removing his pajamas and inspecting as much of his body as was visible. It was the smooth body of a little boy. That was ridiculous. He was a man of forty-three, an army officer, a chemist, once a best-selling novelist. He had been married and divorced ten years ago. He looked again at his body. It was only twelve years old. Fourteen at the very oldest. His eyes swept the room, wide with wonder. Every detail was familiar. The flower-splashed chair covers, the table that served as desk and catch-hall for his possessions, 
the dresser with its mirror stuck full of pictures of aircraft. It was the bedroom of his childhood home. He swung his legs over the edge of the bed. They were six inches too short to reach the floor. For an instant, the room spun dizzily, and he was in the grip of utter panic, all confidence in the evidence of his senses lost. Was he insane, or delirious, or had the bomb really killed him? Was this what death was like? What was that thing about ye become as little children? He started to laugh, and his juvenile larynx made giggling sounds. They seemed funny, too, and aggravated his mirth. For a little while he was on the edge of hysteria, and then, when he managed to control his laughter, he felt calmer. If he were dead, then he must be a discarnate entity, and would be able to penetrate matter. To his relief, he was unable to push his hand through the bed. So he was alive. He was also fully awake, and he hoped rational. He rose to his feet and prowled about the room, taking stock of its contents. There was no calendar in sight, and he could find no newspapers or dated periodicals, but he knew that it was prior to July 18, 1946. On that day, his fourteenth birthday, his father had given him a light twenty-two rifle, and it had been hung on a pair of rustic forks on the wall. It was not there now, nor ever had been. On the table he saw a boy's book of military aircraft, with a clean new dust jacket. The flyleaf was inscribed, To Alan Hartley, from his father, on his thirteenth birthday, seven eighteen forty five. Glancing out the window at the foliage on the trees, he estimated the date at late July or early August, 1945. That would make him just thirteen. His clothes were draped on a chair beside the bed. Stripping off his pajamas, he donned shorts, then sat down and picked up a pair of lemon-colored socks, which he regarded with disfavor. As he pulled one on, a church bell began to clang. St. Boniface, up on the hill, ringing for early mass. So this was Sunday. He paused, the second sock in his hand. There was no question that his present environment was actual. Yet, on the other hand, he possessed a set of memories completely at variance with it. Now, suppose, since his environment were not an illusion, everything else were. Suppose all these troublesome memories were no more than a dream. Why, he was just little Alan Hartley, safe in his room on a Sunday morning, badly scared by a nightmare. Too much science fiction, Alan, too many comic books. That was a wonderfully comforting thought, and he hugged it to him contentedly. It lasted all the while he was buttoning up his shirt and pulling on his pants. But when he reached for his shoes, it evaporated. Ever since he had wakened, he realized he had been occupied with thoughts utterly incomprehensible to any thirteen-year-old, even thinking in words that would have been so much Sanskrit to himself at thirteen. He shook his head regretfully. The just-a-dream hypothesis went by the deep six. He picked up the second shoe and glared at it as though it were responsible for his predicament. He was going to have to be careful. An unexpected display of adult characteristics might give rise to some questions he would find hard to answer credibly. Fortunately, he was an only child. There would be no brothers or sisters to trip him up. Old Mrs. Stauber, the housekeeper, wouldn't be much of a problem, even in his normal childhood. He had bulked like an intellectual giant in comparison to her. But his father! Now, there the going would be tough. He knew that shrewd attorney's mind, wetted keen on a generation of lying and reluctant witnesses. Sooner or later he would forget for an instant and betray himself. Then he smiled, remembering the books he had discovered in his late teens, on his father's shelves, and recalling the character of the open-minded agnostic lawyer. If he could only avoid the inevitable unmasking until he had a plausible explanatory theory. Blake Hartley was leaving the bathroom as Alan Hartley opened his door and stepped into the hall. 
The lawyer was bare-armed and in slippers. At forty-eight, there was only a faint powdering of gray in his dark hair, and not a gray thread in his clipped mustache. The old merry widower himself, Alan thought, grinning as he remembered the white-haired but still vigorous man from whom he'd parted at the outbreak of the war. "'Morning, Dad,' he greeted. "'Morning, son. You're up early. Going to Sunday school?' Now, there was the advantage of a father who'd cut his first intellectual tooth on Tom Paine and Bob Ingersoll. Attendance at divine services was on a strictly voluntary basis. "'Why, I don't think so. I want to do some reading this morning.' "'That's always a good thing to do,' Blake Hartley approved. "'After breakfast, suppose you take a walk down to the station and get me at times.' He dug in his trouser pocket and came out with a half-dollar. Get anything you want for yourself while you're at it. Alan thanked his father and pocketed the coin. Mrs. Dauber will be at Mass, he suggested. Say, I get the paper now. Breakfast won't be ready till she gets here. Good idea, Blake Hartley nodded. Please, you'll have three quarters of an hour at least. So far, he congratulated himself. Everything had gone smoothly. Finishing his toilet, he went downstairs and on to the street, turning left at Brandon to Campbell, and left again in the direction of the station. Before he reached the underpass, a dozen half-forgotten memories had revived. Here was a house that would, in a few years, be gutted by fire. Here were four dwellings standing where he had last seen a five-story apartment building. A gasoline station and a weed-grown lot would shortly be replaced by a supermarket. The environs of the station itself were a complete puzzle to him, until he oriented himself. He bought a New York Times, glancing first of all at the date line. Sunday, August 5, 1945. He'd estimated pretty closely. The Battle of Okinawa had been won. The Potsdam Conference had just ended. There were still pictures of the B-25 crash against the Empire State Building a week ago Saturday and japan was still being pounded by bombs from the air and shells from offshore naval guns why tomorrow hiroshima was due for the big job it amused him to reflect that he was probably the only person in williamsport who knew that on the way home a boy sitting on the top step of the front porch hailed him alan replied cordially trying to remember who it was of course larry morton he and Alan had been buddies. They probably had been swimming or playing commandos and Germans the afternoon before. Larry had gone to Cornell the same year that Alan had gone to Penn State. They had both graduated in 1954. Larry had gotten into some government bureau, and then he had married a Pittsburgh girl and had become twelfth vice president of her father's firm. He had been killed in 1968 in a plane crash. "'You gone to Sunday school?' Larry asked, mercifully unaware of the fate Alan foresaw for him. "'Why, no. I have some things I want to do at home.' He'd have to watch himself. Larry would spot a difference quicker than any adult. "'Heck with it,' he added. "'Golly, I wished I could stay home from Sunday school whenever I wanted to,' Larry envied. "'How about us going swimming at the canoe club, after?' Alan thought fast. "'Gee, I wished could,' he replied, lowering his grammatical sights. "'I gotta stay home, Safter. "'We're expecting company, couple of aunts of mine. "'Dad wants me to stay home when they come.' "'That went over all right. "'Anybody knew that there was no rational accounting "'for the vagaries of the adult mind "'and no appeal from adult demands. "'The prospect of company at the Hartley home "'would keep Larry away that afternoon. "'He showed his disappointment.' "'Ah, jeepers creepers!' he blasphemed euphemistically. "'Maybe tomorrow,' Alan said. "'If I can make it. I gotta go now. Ain't had breakfast yet.' He scuffed his feet boyishly, exchanged so longs with his friend, and continued homeward. As he had hoped, the Sunday paper kept his father occupied at breakfast, to the exclusion of any dangerous table talk. Blake Hartley was still deep in the financial section when Alan left the table, and went to the library. There should be two books there to which he wanted badly to refer. For a while he was afraid that his father had not 
acquired them prior to 1945, but he finally found them and carried them on to the front porch, along with a pencil and a ruled yellow scratch pad. In his experienced future, or his past to come, Alan Hartley had been accustomed to doing his thinking with a pencil. As reporter, as novelist, plotting his work, as amateur chemist in his home laboratory, as scientific warfare research officer, his ideas had always been clarified by making notes. He pushed a chair to the table and built up the seat with cushions, wondering how soon he would become used to the proportional disparity between himself and the furniture. As he opened the books and took his pencil in his hand, there was one thing missing. If he could only smoke a pipe now! His father came out and stretched in a wicker chair with the Times book review section. The morning hours passed. Alan Hartley leafed through one book and then the other. His pencil moved rapidly at times. At others he doodled absently. There was no question any more in his mind as to what or who he was. He was Alan Hartley, a man of forty-three, marooned in his own thirteen-year-old body, thirty years back in his own past. That was, of course, against all common sense, but he was easily able to ignore that objection. He had been made before, against the astronomy of Copernicus and the geography of Columbus, and the biology of Darwin and the industrial technology of Samuel Colt, and the military doctrines of Charles de Gaulle. Today's common sense had a habit of turning into tomorrow's utter nonsense. What he needed, right now, but bad, was a theory that would explain what had happened to him. Understanding was beginning to dawn when Mrs. Stauber came out to announce midday dinner. "'I hope you won't mind having it so early,' she apologized. "'My sister, Jenny, offer a nip and nose. She is sick. I want to go see her this afternoon. Yet, I'll be back in plenty time to get supper, Mr. Hartley.' "'Hey, Dad!' Alan spoke up. "'Why can't we get our own supper and have a picnic-like? That'd be fun, and Mrs. Stauber could stay as long as she wanted to.' His father looked at him. Such consideration for others was a most gratifying deviation from the juvenile norm, dawn of altruism or something. He gave hearty assent. "'Why, of course, Mrs. Stauber. Alan and I can shift for ourselves this evening, can't we, Alan? You needn't come back till tomorrow morning.' "'Ach!' Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Hartley. At dinner, Alan got out from under the burden of conversation by questioning his father about the war and luring him into a lengthy dissertation on the difficulties of the forthcoming invasion of Japan. In view of what he remembered of the next twenty-four hours, Alan was secretly amused. His father was sure that the war would run on to mid-1946. After dinner, they returned to the porch. Hartley Pear, smoking a cigar and carrying out several law books. He only glanced at these occasionally. For the most part, he sat and blew smoke rings and watched them float away. Some thrice guilty felon was about to be triumphantly acquitted by a weeping jury. Allen could recognize a courtroom masterpiece in the process of incubation. It was several hours later that the crunch of feet on the walk caused father and son to look up simultaneously. The approaching visitor was a tall man in a rumpled black suit. He had knobby wrists and big, awkward hands, black hair flecked with gray, and a harsh, bigoted face. Alan remembered him. Frank Gutchall. Lived on Campbell Street, a religious fanatic, and some sort of lay preacher. Maybe he needed legal advice. Alan could vaguely remember some incident. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Gutchall. Lovely day, isn't it? Blake Hartley said. Gutchall cleared his throat. Mr. Hartley, I wonder if you could lend me a gun and some bullets, he began, embarrassedly. My little dog's been hurt, and it's suffering something terrible. I want a gun to put the poor thing out of its pain. Why, yes, of course. How would a twenty-gauge shotgun do? Blake Hartley asked. You wouldn't want anything heavy. Gutchall fidgeted. Why, er, I was hoping you'd let me have a little gun. He held his hands about six inches apart. A pistol that I could put in my pocket. It wouldn't look right to carry a hunting gun on the Lord's Day. People wouldn't understand that it was for a work of mercy. 
the lawyer nodded in view of gutchell's religious beliefs the objection made sense well i have a colt thirty eight special he said but you know i belong to this auxiliary police outfit if i were called out for duty this evening i'd need it how soon could you bring it back something clicked in alan hartley's mind he remembered now what that incident had been he knew too what he had to do dad aren't there some cartridges left for the luger he asked blake hartley snapped his fingers by george yes i have a german automatic i can let you have but i wish you'd bring it back as soon as possible i'll get it for you before he could rise alan was on his feet sit still dad i'll get it i know where the cartridges are with that he darted into the house and upstairs the luger hung on the wall over his father's bed getting it down he dismounted it working with rapid precision he used the blade of his pocket knife to unlock the end piece of the breech block slipping out the firing pin and buttoning it into his shirt pocket then he reassembled the harmless pistol and filled the clip with nine millimeter cartridges from the bureau drawer there was an extension telephone beside the bed finding gutchell's address in the directory he lifted the telephone and stretched his handkerchief over the mouthpiece then he dialed police headquarters this is blake hartley he lied deepening his voice and copying his father's tone frank gutchell who lives at take this down he gave gutchell's address has just borrowed a pistol from me ostensibly to shoot a dog he has no dog he intends shooting his wife don't argue about how i know there isn't time just take it for granted that i do i disabled the pistol took out the firing pin but if he finds out what i did he may get some other weapon he's on his way home but he's on foot if you hurry you may get a man there before he arrives and grab him before he finds out the pistol won't shoot okay mr hartley we'll take care of it thanks and i wish you'd get my pistol back as soon as you can it's something i brought home from the other war and i shouldn't like to lose it we'll take care of that too thank you mr hartley he hung up and carried the luger and the loaded clip down to the porch look mr gutchell here's how it works he said showing it to the visitor then he slapped in the clip and yanked up on the toggle loading the chamber it's ready to shoot now this is the safety he pushed it on when you're ready to shoot just shove it forward and up and then pull the trigger you have to pull the trigger each time it's loaded for eight shots and be sure to put the safety back when you're through shooting did you load the chamber blake hartley demanded sure it's on safe now let me see his father took the pistol being careful to keep his finger out of the trigger guard and looked at it yes that's all right he repeated the instructions alan had given stressing the importance of putting the safety on after using understand how it works now he asked yes i understand how it works thank you mr hartley thank you too young man gutchell put the luger in his hip pocket made sure it wouldn't fall out and took his departure you shouldn't have loaded it hartley pear reproved when he was gone alan sighed this was it the masquerade was over i had to to keep you from fooling with it he said I didn't want you finding out that I'd taken out the firing pin. You what? Gutchell didn't want that gun to shoot a dog. He has no dog. He meant to shoot his wife with it. He's a religious maniac, sees visions, hears voices, receives revelations, talks with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost probably put him up to this caper. I'll submit that any man who holds long conversations with a deity isn't to be trusted with a gun and neither is any man who lies about why he wants one and while i was at it i called the police on the upstairs phone i had to use your name i deepened my voice and talked through a handkerchief you blake hartley jumped as though bee stung why did you have to do that you know why i couldn't have told them this is little alan hartley just thirteen years old please mr policeman go and arrest frank gutchell before he goes root toot toot at his wife with my papa's luger that would have gone over big now wouldn't it and suppose he really wants to shoot a dog what sort of mess will i be in no mess at all 
If I'm wrong, which I'm not, I'll take the thump for it myself. It'll pass for a dumb kid trick, and nothing'll be done. But if I'm right, you'll have to front for me. They'll keep your name out of it, but they'd give me a lot of cheap boy hero publicity, which I don't want. He picked up his pencil again. We should have the complete returns in about twenty minutes. That was a ten-minute underestimate, and it was another quarter hour before the detective sergeant who returned the Luger had finished congratulating Blake Hartley and giving him the thanks of the department. After he had gone, the lawyer picked up the Luger, withdrew the clip, and ejected the round in the chamber. Well, he told his son, you were right. You saved that woman's life. He looked at the automatic and then handed it across the table. Now, let's see you put that firing pin back. Alan Hartley dismantled the weapon, inserted the missing part, and put it together again, then snapped it experimentally, and returned it to his father. Blake Hartley looked at it again, and laid it on the table. Now, son, suppose we have a little talk, he said softly. But I explained everything, Alan objected innocently. You did not. His father retorted, Yesterday you'd never have thought of a trick like this. Why, you wouldn't even have known how to take this pistol apart. And at dinner, I caught you using language and expressing ideas that were entirely outside anything you'd ever known before. Now, I want to know, and I mean this literally. Alan chuckled. I hope you're not toying with the rather medieval notion of obsession, he said. Blake Hartley started. Something very like that must have been flitting through his mind. He opened his mouth to say something, then closed it abruptly. The trouble is, I'm not sure you aren't right, his son continued. You say you find me changed. When did you first notice a difference? Last night, you were still my little boy. This morning, Blake Hartley was talking more to himself than to Alan. I don't know. You were unusually silent at breakfast, and come to think of it, there was something, something strange about you when I saw you in the hall upstairs. Alan! he burst out vehemently. What has happened to you? Alan Hartley felt a twinge of pain. What his father was going through was almost what he himself had endured in the first few minutes after waking. I wish I could be sure of myself, Dad, he said. You see, when I woke this morning, I hadn't the least recollection of anything I'd done yesterday. August 4th, 1945, that is, he specified. I was positively convinced that I was a man of 43, and my last memory was of lying on a stretcher, injured by a bomb explosion, and I was equally convinced that this had happened in 1975. Huh? His father straightened. Did you say 1975? He thought for a moment. That's right. In 1975, you will be 43. A bomb, you say? Alan nodded. During the siege of Buffalo, in the Third World War, he said, I was a captain in G5, Scientific Warfare, General Staff. There'd been a transpolar air invasion of Canada, and I'd been sent to the front to check on service failures of a new lubricating oil for combat equipment. A week after I got there, Ottawa fell, and the retreat started. We made a stand at Buffalo, and that was where I copped it. I remember being picked up and getting a narcotic injection. The next thing I knew, I was in bed, upstairs, and it was 1945 again, and I was back in my own little thirteen-year-old body. Oh, Alan, you just had a nightmare to end nightmares, his father assured him, laughing a trifle too heartily. That's all. That was one of the first things I thought of. I had to reject it. It just wouldn't fill the facts. Look, a normal dream is part of the dreamer's own physical brain, isn't it? Well, here is a part about 2,000% greater than the whole from which it was taken, which is absurd. You mean all this Battle of Buffalo stuff? That's easy. All the radio commentators have been harping on the horrors of World War III, and you couldn't have avoided hearing some of it. You just have an undigested chunk of H.V. Kaltenborn raising hell in your subconscious. It wasn't just World War III. It was everything. My four years at high school, and my four years at Penn State, and seven years as a reporter on the Philadelphia Record, and my novels, Children of the Mist, Rose of Death, 
Conqueror's Road. They were no kid stuff. Why, yesterday, I'd never even have thought of some of the ideas I used in my detective stories that I published under a nom de plume. And my hobby, chemistry, I was pretty good at that. Patented a couple of processes that made me as much money as my writing. You think a thirteen-year-old just dreamed all that up? Or here, you speak French, don't you? He switched languages and spoke at some length in good conversational slang spice Parisian. Too bad you don't speak Spanish, too, he added, reverting to English. Except for a Mexican accent, you could cut with a machete. I'm even better there than in French, and I know some German and a little Russian. Blake Hartley was staring at his son, stunned. It was some time before he could make himself speak. I could barely keep up with you in French he admitted. I can swear that in the last thirteen years of your life you had absolutely no chance to learn it. All right, you lived till 1975, you say. Then, all of a sudden, you found yourself back here, thirteen years old, in 1945. I suppose you remember everything in between, he asked. Did you ever read James Branch Cabell? Remember Florian de Poussin in The High Place? Yes, you find the same idea in Jurgen, too, Alan said. You know, I'm beginning to wonder if, if Cable mightn't have known something he didn't want to write. But it's impossible! Blake Hartley hit the table with his hand, so hard that the heavy pistol bounced. The loose round he had ejected from the chamber toppled over and started to roll, falling off the edge. He stooped and picked it up. How can you go back against time? And the time you claim you came from doesn't exist now. It hasn't happened yet. He reached for the pistol magazine to insert the cartridge, and as he did, he saw the books in front of his son. Dunn's experiment with time, he commented, and J. N. M. Tyrell's science and psychical phenomena. Are you trying to work out a theory? Yes. It encouraged Alan to see that his father had unconsciously adopted an adult-to-adult -adult manner. I think I'm getting somewhere, too. You've read these books? Well, look, Dad, what's your attitude on precognition? The ability of the human mind to exhibit real knowledge apart from logical inference of future events? You think Dunn is telling the truth about his experiences? Or that the cases in Tyrell's book are properly verified and can't be explained away on the basis of chance? Blake Hartley frowned. I don't know, he confessed. The evidence is the sort that any court in the world would accept if it concerned ordinary, normal events, especially the cases investigated by the Society for Psychical Research. They have been verified. But how can anybody know of something that hasn't happened yet? If it hasn't happened yet, it doesn't exist, and you can't have real knowledge of something that has no real existence. Tyrell discusses that dilemma and doesn't dispose of it. I think I can. If somebody has real knowledge of the future, then the future must be available to the present mind. And if any moment other than the bare present exists, then all time must be totally present. Every moment must be perpetually coexistent with every other moment, Alan said. Yes, I think I see what you mean. That was Dunn's idea, wasn't it? No. Dunn postulated an infinite series of time dimensions, the entire extent of each being the bare present moment of the next. What I'm postulating is the perpetual coexistence of every moment of time in this dimension, just as every graduation on a yardstick exists equally with every other graduation, but each at a different point in space. Well, as far as duration and sequence go, that's all right, the father agreed. But how about the passage of time? Well, time does appear to pass. So does the landscape you see from a moving car window. I'll suggest that both are illusions of the same kind. We imagine time to be dynamic, because we've never viewed it from a fixed point. But if it is totally present, then it must be static. And in that case, we're moving through time. That seems all right. But what's your car window? If all time is totally present, then you must exist simultaneously at every moment along your individual lifespan, Alan said. Your physical body 
and your mind and all the thoughts contained in your mind each at its appropriate moment in sequence but what is it that exists only at the very moment we think of as now blake hartley grinned already he was expecting his small son as an intellectual equal please teacher what your consciousness and don't say what's that teacher doesn't know but we're only conscious of one moment the illusory one this is now and it was now when you asked that question and it'll be now when i stop talking but each is a different moment we imagine that all those nows are rushing past us really they're standing still and our consciousness is whizzing past them his father thought that over for some time then he sat up hey he cried suddenly if some part of our ego is time-free and passes from moment to moment it must be extra-physical because the physical body exists at every moment through which the consciousness passes and if it's extra-physical there's no reason whatever for assuming that it passes out of existence when it reaches the moment of the death of the body why there's logical evidence for survival independent of any alleged spirit communication you can toss out patience worth and mrs osborne leonard's feta and sir oliver lodge's son and wilfred brandon and all the other spirit communicators and you still have evidence i hadn't thought of that alan confessed i think you're right well let's put that at the bottom of the agenda and get on with this time business you lose consciousness as in sleep where does your consciousness go I think it simply detaches from the moment at which you go to sleep, and moves backward or forward along the line of moment, sequence, to some prior or subsequent moment, attaching there. Well, why don't we know anything about that? Blake Hartley asked. It never seems to happen. We go to sleep tonight, and it's always tomorrow morning when we wake, never day before yesterday, or last month, or next year. It never, or almost never, seems to happen you're right there know why because if the consciousness goes forward it attaches at a moment when the physical brain contains memories of the previous consciously and unexperienced moment you wake remembering the evening before because that's the memory contained in your mind at that moment and back of it are memories of all the events in the interim see yes but how about backward movement like this experience of yours this experience of mine may not be unique, but I never heard of another case like it. What usually happens is that the memories carried back by the consciousness are buried in the subconscious mind. You know how thick the wall between the subconscious and the conscious mind is. These dreams of Dunn's and the cases in Tyrell's book are leakage. That's why precognitions are usually incomplete and distorted and generally trivial. The wonder isn't that good cases are so few. It's surprising that there are any at all. Alan looked at the papers in front of him. I haven't begun to theorize about how I managed to remember everything. It may have been the radiations from the bomb, or the effect of the narcotic, or both together, or something at this end, or a combination of all three. But the fact remains that my subconscious barrier didn't function, and everything got through so you see i am obsessed by my own future identity and i'd been afraid that you'd been well taken over by some some outsider blake hartley grinned weakly i don't mind admitting alan that what's happened has been a shock but that other i just couldn't have taken that no not and stayed sane but really, I am your son, the same entity I was yesterday. I've just had what you might call an educational shortcut. I'll say you have, his father laughed in real amusement. He discovered that his cigar had gone out and relit it. Here, if you can remember the next thirty years, suppose you tell me when the war is going to end. This one, I mean. The Japanese surrender will be announced at exactly 1901. 7.01 p.m. present style, on August 14, a week from Tuesday. Better make sure we have plenty of grub in the house by then. Everything will be closed up tight till Thursday morning, even the restaurants. I remember we had nothing to eat in the house but some scraps. Well, 
it is handy having a profit in the family i'll see to it mrs stauber gets plenty of groceries in tuesday a week that's pretty sudden isn't it the japs are going to think so allan replied he went on to describe what was going to happen his father swore softly you know i've heard talk about atomic energy but i thought it was just buck rogers stuff was that the sort of bomb that got you that was a firecracker to the bomb that got me that thing exploded a good ten miles away blake hartley whistled softly and that's going to happen in thirty years you know son if i were you i wouldn't like to have to know about a thing like that he looked at allan for a moment please if you know don't ever tell me when i'm going to die allan smiled i can't i had a letter from you just before i left for the front you were seventy-eight then and you were still hunting and fishing and flying your own plane but i'm not going to get killed in any battle of buffalo this time and if i can prevent it and i think i can there won't be any world war three but you say all time exists perpetually coexistent and totally present his father said then it's right there in front of you and you're getting closer to it every watch tick allan hartley shook his head you know what i remembered when frank gutchell came to borrow a gun he asked well the other time i hadn't been home i'd been swimming at the canoe club with larry morton when i got home about a half hour from now i found the house full of cops gutchell talked the thirty-eight officers model out of you and gone home he'd shot his wife four times through the body finished her off with another one back of the ear and then used his sixth shot to blast his brains out the cops traced the gun they took a very poor view of your lending it to him you never got it back trust that gang to keep a good gun the lawyer said i didn't want to lose it this time and i didn't want to see you lose face around city hall gutchalls of course are expendable allan said but my main reason for fixing frank gutchall up with the padded cell was that i wanted to know whether or not the future could be altered i have it on experimental authority that it can be there must be additional dimensions of time lines of alternative probabilities something like william seabrook's witch doctor friends fan-shaped destiny when i brought memories of the future back to the present i added certain factors to the causal chain that set up an entirely new line of probabilities on no notice at all i stopped a murder and a suicide with thirty years to work i can stop a world war i'll have the means to do it too the means unlimited wealth and influence here Allan picked up a sheet and handed it to his father. Used properly, we can make two or three million on that alone. A list of all the Kentucky Derby, Preakness, and Belmont winners to 1970. That'll furnish us primary capital. Then, remember, I was something of a chemist. I took it up originally to get background material for one of my detective stories. It fascinated me, and I made it a hobby, and then a source of income. I'm thirty years ahead of any chemist in the world now. You remember I.G. Farben Industry? Ten years from now, we'll make them look like pikers. His father looked at the yellow sheet. Assault at eight to one, he said. I can scrape up about five thousand for that. Yes, in ten years. Any other little operations you have in mind? He asked. About 1950, we start building a political organization here in pennsylvania in nineteen sixty i think we can elect you president the world situation will be crucial by that time and we had a good-natured nonentity in the white house then who let things go till war became inevitable i think president hartley can be trusted to take a strong line of policy in the meantime you can read machiavelli that's my little boy talking blake hartley said softly all right, son, I'll do just what you tell me, and when you grow up, I'll be president. Let's go get supper now. End of Time and Time Again by H. Beam Piper